आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of the great icons of Indian art. He's been described as the think tank of contemporary Indian art. Uh he's had more than 40 exhibitions around the world, another one due to open in Bombay next month. He's had a very distinctive style of painting, sort of the hallmark of any great painter. I'm delighted to welcome Krishan Khanna. Uh you started off with um uh, dimensions of your career which would sort of you know lead more to a coarsening of sensibility than the refining of it. You went to to Windsor and and, and went to um, you know military college. You came back and started working on the bank. So that was quite a beginning uh, of a career that has ended up in so illustriously as 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 an artist of great sensibility and sensitivity. <laughs> good training good training for any artist I'd say <laughs> to 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 have had a kind of a um, for one thing i mean the school i went to a wasn't military as such but it provided for most people did go and most boys did eventually end up in the forces and this was during the war so it became even more so and i was down for it as well and i think it's the hand of fate which prevented me from uh, either being shot or destroyed <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or landing up or being um, resulting uh, uh, being a being a general or something <laughs> so, <laughs> so i was saved from all of that uh -huh, uh -huh. and um but what it did do i think in the more more positive kind of uh, fashion was that uh, it it gave me a sense of discipline which i think is uh, stood by me in in great stead mm -hmm. and it's it's uh, it's good to be disciplined i mm -hmm. think otherwise uh, you can be waiting for uh, inspirations mm -hmm. <laughs> so how important is inspiration then um uh, for an artist and you talk about discipline mm -hmm. so presumably there are sort of several kinds of discipline and there is a discipline of just sort of uh, you know standing in front of your canvas and and waiting for inspiration is that the discipline or is that the discipline of constantly training yourself for the craft the mm -hmm. skill and the control well i think the the the, the <laughs> the craft the skill and the control as you call it uh, <laughs> is very necessary and is there and has to be trodden uh, every day so that when when the great moment comes you're ready for it because if you think that it's just going to drop like manna from the skies it doesn't do that you know and when it does you're not equipped to hold it so you your equipment has to be good you've got to be in your stride to be able to take anything and these things happen only the 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 inspiration comes when you are in stride you know then you see uh, from a painting to the next to the next things which are happening and, and that has its own dialectic its own kind of uh, matter of functioning so that's where discipline is and that okay, you let's <laughs> let's you know, lead us through yeah. a painting okay. <laughs> and uh, you know the the, the, the process of, of of creation mm -hmm. um you know what is the the first impulse an emotion an image a feeling <laughs> yes. a metaphor <laughs> well quite often you know these uh, th these ideas and thoughts uh, come unannounced uh, at least uh, uh, they may be there in the in the in the uh, in your subconscious maybe or uh, tucked away somewhere and then they emerge and when they emerge there's an element of surprise in recognizing that it is there and is this sort of emerging when you see it on on canvas and it takes form and shape in 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 a physical Naturally, sense Naturally I mean the, the, the whole business of painting isn't just putting down on the image that you had in mind as it were you know um the image itself develops and is the image that then becomes uh, very important so what is that this mad rush of eureka in the middle of the night you have to go out and paint or does it no, no, await no. the discipline of 10 o'clock in it's the morning it's 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 it's, <laughs> it's it's nothing it's nothing as uh, ecstatic as that <laughs> but it is ecstatic that but that you you have this thing and you nurse it and you think about it and then you some often of times you you reject it you don't think about it you know but if the idea is any good it persists it keeps on happening it keeps on coming back again and again and then you say okay you know you have your canvas and paper or whatever 
ready. And you go down and have a bash at it. So is there grow. sort of a, a preliminary work to do a rough sketch or something before well, you go on to say a canvas? I know you sketch too, but we'll come to that. I minute. draw a yeah. lot, uh -huh. but I mean, I, I, I really don't sort of draw as a, as a preparatory exercise to a painting. I think the painting has to happen. And and it grows on its own, you know, like a human being. I mean, you don't uh, you don't prepare. It's not a military exercise <laughs> where you sort of uh, have taught the fellow to go and face the bullet test, uh -huh. where and then he goes out there and you know succeeds or doesn't succeed. It's it's, it's never like that. But it's uh, you get an idea, and if the idea persists and if it's any good, and then I think uh, it emerges. Educate me. You get an idea. Uh, you know, you have a painting. Of, you know, Bandwala. So, or, or mm. you know, amongst many sort of, uh, you know, you've done you've done these series on, on Rumi the poet and yeah. Christ and, and, and the Mahabharat. Uh, so, you know, you have an idea. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's to do with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, I is it sort of a, a conceptual idea? Is it an is is the idea already in the form of an image? You want to look at you know the passion, the suffering of Christ. What is it that that is first born? Well, in the case of Christ, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, uh, I was living in Nizamuddin, mm -hmm. and uh, there's, a, there's a great uh, institution there. I mean, the whole, you know, there's a whole college of uh, Islamic studies there and so on. And people from all over the world come there. And they come, they're humble people. But, uh, they come, uh, they're sort of scholars, and they come with their bedrolls on their shoulders and so on, and, and they trundle in, they walk through these narrow lanes and so on, and then they go and go. And uh, it occurred to me, in fact, my father suggested to me, he said, well, it's very strange, you know, this is the kind of situation in which Christ could have been. Any one of these people could have been a, uh, could have been a Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been <coughs> taught to consider Christ as a good Anglo-Saxon. Of course, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he wasn't the en kind of angelic figure, you know, as has been made out to be in European art. Uh, he was like my Nizamuddin figures, you know, uh, walking the streets, wearing a lungi and a shirt, sitting down, talking to people, getting a jund around him, you know, talking. So, you know, this whole business fascinated me to think that, that right in the midst of our, our contemporary situation, which we see every single day, uh, something very important can be happening without your knowing it. And these uh, important things happen that way. I don't think they're sort of predestined, they're predestined, yes, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't, um, they're not imposed on a situation, you know. They grow. And I think the Nizamuddin is a, is, a, is a case in point. And Christ, my pictures of Christ. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, having taken up the subject of Christ, then all sorts of things grow around it, you know. I mean, the whole business of perfidy, of um, letting him down, betrayal, um, the whole business of a state, mm -hmm. uh, the force of a state, the teeth of a state, mm -hmm. uh, as against, uh, uh, apropos, I would say not against, but uh, the moral force of the man and what he was saying. And they were not understanding each other. Mm -hmm. And when the, when, um, the Roman, when, when Pilate did try to understand him, then the people didn't understand him. You know. So uh, how, how important is this, this narrative uh, that, that, you're, that you're giving me about all that you, you went through and, and, yeah. and, and, and the insights you got mm -hmm. in, in, in understanding and appreciating and responding mm -hmm. to the series paintings? Um, you know, to my mind, as, 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 as a viewer, and I've only seen it in prints, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is that, uh, you know, much of this comes across intuitively yes. and not really intellectually. Yes. Uh, and, and so how much of it have you sort of intel intellectualized before passing it on or surrendering it to intuition and then, and then letting it well, be I on canvas? I, 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 I don't think the two <laughs> processes are uh, uh -huh. separate. They're not segregated. You know, it's not one and then the other. Uh, it all happens somehow. It dovetails itself from one into another. It's, uh, you can't stop thinking. I wish sometimes I could, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. You we'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> uh, you, you, <laughs> keep, you keep thinking about it, uh -huh. but you're not. Uh, you're not. Uh, you're not painting, painting out a theory. Mm -hmm. You know, painting isn't uh, for uh, for me anyway. Uh, it may be for others. You know, something else. But for me, painting is not. Uh, 
um, an exposition of a theory. We were just talking about you know, the idea, the ideology, and the, you know, the, the intellectual circumscribing of painting. You, you were with this, you know, a group of leftist painters introduced by uh, M.F. Hussein, uh, obviously circumscribed by a very strong sense of, of ideology. Uh, you know, the role of painting mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in catalyzing social change. Uh, has that been an enduring influence? Well, f first let me correct <laughs> one thing. That they were not, they were, they called themselves uh, progressive painters. Uh -huh. yeah. They were not leftists as such. Uh -huh. Souza began by, uh -huh. uh, by being a leftist, but he, s he abandoned that uh, position very fast. I mean, he wasn't going to be um, a, a communist painter, you see. And, uh, he wanted freedom, you know, no bounds and so forth. Uh, so progressive then was being used in terms of breaking away, changing uh, the matrix of painting, moving away from what was already there as accepted painting, you see, and accepted subject matter for painting and so forth. So um, when I joined these people, I mean, I, I, I too had this, this, this feeling that one was not satisfied with uh, the, the, the status quo as it was. What was the status quo? The status quo was sort of things that were with, with a great deal of control, almost imitative kind of painting, realistic. Realistic, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say, but uh, I mean, yes, imitative. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, also sort of uh, romantic, you know, women by the well and uh, sort of a nostalgia for uh, the rustic, uh, rather like, uh, like Little words worth him in that <laughs> sense, you know. But um, no, um, it, so it was against that. It was to liberate painting, and, and gradually this business of liberation, and like all movements do, they uh, spill over to excess. And then what became more important was the form of painting itself, rather than what you had to say. And subject matter was relegated, you know, to the boondocks. Mm -hmm. uh, so the. Um, uh, it's what it's the way you said things which became very important. The so style, the emergence of a style became very important. I mean, you'll notice that all these painters, for instance, and they were very, very different to each other. So there was no sort of great thread of binding through them. You know, there was no universal philosophy except that um, a they were uh, not in favor of uh, what was in existence at the time, B, that what they th said, the form is what mattered. You know. And this form was, again, mm. uh, very much in vogue in Europe. I mean, the whole business of uh, formal painting and so on emerged from that. And this was accepted and aided by um, certain um, refugees from Hitler who happened to be in Bombay at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's sometimes considered by some that this is a very unfortunate event that we had these uh, learned uh, Europeans there who were directing the course of our Indian art. That but there were the painters, critics, writers? Critics. I mean, there yeah. were people who were, well, they were collectors. I mean, men like Schlesinger, who set up a, an industry in Bombay, uh, he was a great collector. He bought in every single show that uh, <coughs> he went to. And he had a great eye. He was passionate about painting. No matter what, he was very passionate. And it wasn't only about European art that he was passionate. He had a great collection of Indian bronzes, I mean, for instance, which are wonderful. So this theory of form did, does, in a sense, work there. You see. It's not only, um, uh, it's not Eurocentric, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. spreads itself farther. Uh, there was uh, Leiden, and there was Langhammer, who was then the um, uh, Times of India, and uh, Illustrated Weekly, to be correct. And he, they had, he was a painter, a uh, painter from the school of Kokoschka and so on. So there was European expressionism which came in. And through him, uh, through that kind of thing, we learned about Kokoschka and, you know, Klimt and all these people. And so there was a very a distinct influence of those people. And, uh, but it didn't, we, we were not imitators of these people. Mm -hmm. Certainly a man like Souza, for instance, I mean, it was claimed that he, uh, John Berger put it, you know, when he had a show in London, I happened to be there at the time, and uh, John Berger said, you know, he serves, he has many traditions that he straddles, but he serves none. So he was, uh, uh, and this was the 
this is the difficult point. This so how important is this, this aspect of uh, this dimension of tradition? You know, we talk about Indian art in a globalized environment. Mm -hmm. uh, Indian art is, 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 you know, suddenly seems to be selling internationally. Is very That's another popular matter. Globally. <laughs> 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 so tell us about this other matter. <laughs> which way, about the selling of Indian art. The selling of Indian art because, you know. Well, are you saying that, well, um, let me just sort of clarify this, that is there a distinction between the appeal, the global appeal and global integration of Indian art, uh, 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 or is it just the selling of it and somehow it's become interesting investment or useful investment? You see, global, this whole business is tied up with the whole concept of globalization, uh -huh. and I think uh, this is, it's a very ambivalent thing. I mean, you can, uh, globalization can mean that uh, you'll say the, the, the whole world is kind of reduced to a single principle which is understood by all. It's not that at all, because the world isn't like that. And uh, India certainly doesn't sort of uh, fit into all these categories which are already sort of well, ready. There made. is a universalizing in a sense now. You're universalizing because, because, because a travel is so, so mm -hmm. easy. I mean, the whole travel, world is becoming film, so small. Yeah. So you're looking at things mm -hmm. uh, with uh, m more intimate eyes, you know. And uh, so the whole history of Indian art, for instance, is available. It, and we are different. And there are things which are different. These, uh, these were spelt out by men like Ruskin, for instance, you know that these differences are there, these tendencies are there, and uh, now in contemporary art, these transgress and they go into other cultures. I mean, certainly European painting was influenced very, to a great measure by several, uh, by through several uh, painters, you know, they accepted uh, Eastern ideas, not only Indian, but uh, Japanese, Chinese. But I also meant in the sense that because of the our familiarity with, with, with images from different environments, cultures, landscapes, climates, uh, a whole range of uh, uh, you know, uh, visual vocabulary, uh, we have become far more able to respond to cross-cultural art than yes. we might have been yes. you know, sort of 30, 40 yes. years ago. That's true. So what impact does that have on, on, on the tradition of Indian art as it unfolds? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> the tradition of Indian art, uh, we were never, we never had the canvas. Hmm? We never had the three by four, as it were, the, the four sides of a canvas, uh, which has um, definitely is controlled by a geometry. It's not free space. Mm. We were, the, the, gr the greatest Indian work was mural painting. And uh, this was, it served uh, uh, sociological purposes, so uh, at many other purposes. The aesthetic was one of them. And uh, there, uh, it was free flowing. And it's a very different kind of unity that you see. And it's a different u unity which then spreads itself over a whole area, you know. It's not just one, limited to one canvas to say that this is good, this is bad. Now, all that, in a sense, has changed. We still have mural painting. I mean, I've done a mural. I've done two or three murals. But uh, it's not the order of the day. And when buildings are made, they're not made with the idea of having a mural inside. And in very often what happens is that people are out, our painters are asked then to come in and then and throw painting in as a sort of garnishing to our architecture, which, which it should not be so. It, it has to be an integrated part of the whole proceedings. You know? Well, um, having said that, uh, I don't think we can eradicate or get rid of the whole concept of, uh, of, of paintings as they are. There have been changes uh, which uh, haven't avowedly sort of set themselves up to get rid of it, but there, ha there are alternatives which have happened. You know. What are some of these well, alternatives? Well, I mean, the, the video, for instance, video art. I'm not a video artist, but then I, I think it's there. You know. I can't wish it away. <laughs> Just because I don't do it, it doesn't, it doesn't cease to exist. You know, it's very much then there are artists who are doing some very good work in it. We're just talking about video art. How important has, uh, in, 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 the all, in, in your own sort of span of, of working, your working life, has been the changes in technology, uh, you know, the change of the kind of paints that you get, brushes, uh, textures that you work on. Has that been significant? Well, that was always there, you know. I mean, uh, the, the, the quality of paint that you use uh, has to be appropriate to the surfaces that you're going to paint has on. Has it got better or, or do you mourn? I don't think I it's mean, better or worse. I think it's a question of being pertinent to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is important. Um, uh, for instance, I mean, to, 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 to want to do a mural with a, um, an HB pencil would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, it's, it's inappropriate. There are better and faster <laughs> methods of working. But 
Would uh, you go back to sort of the traditional materials that were used to, to do murals, or are you using new new techniques? No, I'm you? using I'm using uh, current materials. I mean, uh, materials which are going, acrylic is is one of them, and um, it survived and. Um, uh, it's it's a faster medium than oil, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been through its acceleration tests, and it's been proven, mm -hmm. you know. But oil painting has its own fascination. So, do you do you have the sense of uh, of history when you paint that you're going to leave this behind? It's going to be seen, and and and, and in some way, people will peer into your into your consciousness through it's your work. It's never it's never as <laughs> egocentric as that. It's <laughs> never no. But what it, what does happen? Now let me tell you. I mean, it happens. Um, I mean, I'm I'm talking about art as a whole, poetry as a whole, music as a whole, is that the the person becomes less important than what the work is, and the work. Uh, exists and continues to exist and it exists through time and through space and it matters very little I mean whether it was done you know 3,000 years ago 5,000 years ago 10,000 years ago whatever and so when I look at a work uh, which was done like say you know 10,000 years ago and I look at it I'm still in touch with the man who did it he may have gone I, I may never have known known about him or his 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 circumstances or anything, you know, but the fact is that there was a certain human sensibility which crafted this thing, and that comes through. So art really uh, defeats time; it goes past time and space because works done elsewhere will also speak. You know, when I look at some of your work, I'm awed by it. Are you awed by your own work when you look at it and you say, "Goodness, where did that come from?" <laughs> yes, I am. I am. I, I mean, you know, when 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 I think a wonderful, when a good painting happens, a successful painting happens, you look at it and say, "Well, did I do it?" Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'll give you an example: the mural in in the Moria when I was first asked to do this, um, I mean, they said, "Well, how long will it take you? Three months, four months, five months, six months?" So I said, "I don't know. It just." You, you've never commissioned anything as large as this. I've never done anything as large as this. So it, it, it just is a question of having a go at it. That was challenging because that's a dome and you have sort of, uh, there are sort of wooden beams and in a yeah. sense across it. And but it every situation, in. every mural has its condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the condition of this is what you describe, but there are others which have very different conditions and then you have to think them out, you know, you have to uh, work it out as to but how you do you sometimes think that murals and spaces, uh, you know, spaces like that, uh, you know, as, 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 as someone who's aspiring to and, and failing terribly at creativity myself, uh, you know, th there's always this kind of reverence for something that's, that's you know, a piece of art. Of course. And, and that you feel this, that you know, sometimes you feel that this is irreverent, it's that all these people milling around no, and there's this no, beautiful no. dome no, no, up no, there no, I think, I think and I longing th for them to look up. I think, I think, you know, <laughs> Art is for those uh, who see, who can see, who are blessed with sight, and not just physical sight, but who want to see, who can see, and thereby making their own lives much richer. And other people are not bothered. I mean, they can walk through the gallery and not look up and so on, and be worried about their balance sheets, you know. I, I, balance sheets are very good and very important. Well, how important are balance sheets to an artist? Balance sheets are not important. I mean, there are accountants who deal with balance sheets. You know what I mean. I mean, sort of <laughs> figures on the you know the balance no, sheets. No, I mean and money. And you the numbers you are growing Really, what matters is the wherewithal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you've got to. If you, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's this mad rush from. I mean, prices, as you know, have just mm -hmm. gone sky high now. Uh, but but I think uh, what really matters even there is that what you need is the wherewithal to live, and. Uh, and paint and do your work because I think it's a great, great privilege to be able to do what you want to do. And a lot of people either do things or are made to do things which they don't want to do for survival reasons. Uh, and I think uh, an artist, if he's doing what he wants to do, is, uh, is uh, in a sense pays the price for it too. Mm -hmm. Nothing is for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's, I think, you know, one of the great things about art. So, what price do you think you've had to pay? What price? Well, when at a time when my friends were, were, were in penury virtually and they were, had no money and they were working still because they wanted to work, mm -hmm. um, I had a job. I had a. I was a sort of a a, a small but a <laughs> <in> <laughs> yes. And uh, so uh, it's okay. But then I, 
if I wanted to paint, I, would ha I, you know, I used to have to paint at night. So I got very little sleep as a result. And this went on for nearly, you know, close on 14 years, and this was bad. I mean, it was telling on me, and I knew that as you become more senior in your professions, you have to choose which one you want. You can't really ply so many horses at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I, ha I, I made my choice, and that's it. So you've, you know, you've talked about uh, you know, how this process of creativity is sort of an, an, an itch in your fingers that yeah. you just sort of have to get out and complete. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a sort of a, a remaining itch? Is, 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 is there a unique itch that still is, is waiting to find expression to the, you know, that you can wipe out? And what is it? Well, it is there. And it's there, <laughs> it's there most of the time. When you see a good, good bit of paper or pencil or <laughs> crayon or whatever, you know, you, you want to have a go at it. And sometimes you begin without knowing what you're going to do. You, you know, just, just meddling with material. Mm -hmm. And out of that meddling, something happens. And, and um, it's very wonderful when that happens. It's also quite wonderful when it doesn't happen. <laughs> but the <laughs> point, is, point is you defeated time. Because it's 100% it's, it's concentration that goes into it. Time doesn't matter. You eliminated time, in fact. And um, so um, you were involved in what I would say a cosmic process. So in your more sort of mundane, down-to-earth, prosaic moments when you're not in this sort of ecstatic flight of creating painting, <laughs> Do you fear time? Do you fear that you know you're growing older and and, and, and never and, occurs and, and, to me. I said to Hussein the other day, he was going. He said, you know, he's in London having the show, and he said, come along, come along. I said, well, you know, I got my 80th year. He says this stupid business of 80th year and 90th year. You know, <laughs> he said, do you ever think of it? I said, no, I don't. My son thought about it, and you know, so the Moria did a. I did a very nice thing. Of course, I enjoyed it, but it never occurred, never occurred to me. I'm not a birthday boy in that sense, you know. I don't know, I think I haven't crossed one year more or less or whatever. <laughs> what really matters is uh, the ability and the desire and the capacity to be able to go on. And, Vision Kanna, thank you very much. That's been a great my privilege, pleasure. sir. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> You're an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs>